In 1930, MacArthur was appointed Chief of Staff with the rank of full general. During his term of office, much of his time was spent in building an army that had been pared down to only 60,000 combat soldiers, a most difficult effort when an attitude of pacifism dominated the nation. In keeping with his principle of examining the military situation at close range, he toured Europe to observe the forces of other nations. In France, he was recognized once more for his outstanding military contribution to the Allied cause. In Germany, he foresaw the build-up for war. Back home, he begged his country in Congress to realize that the United States was in danger. As chief of staff, he foresaw the need for a new type of army, mechanized, mobile, and insisted that our defense force become capable of rapid expansion. Recognizing his abilities, President Roosevelt broke precedent by reappointing the youngest chief of staff we have ever had to a second term. In the 20s, MacArthur had served in the Philippines, and in the 30s, he was asked to return as their military advisor. A deep mutual regard between the Filipinos and MacArthur grew during this period. It was the basis for a gallant defense that was to come. In 1935, he began a 10-year plan to build up the defense of the Philippines. In World War II, it was to be these forces that MacArthur would lead in a desperate fight, and on this ground. But now the leader, at 57, having served in the United States Army for 34 years, decided to retire. Four years later, it was as though his military career were just beginning. A few months before the attack upon Pearl Harbor, MacArthur had been recalled to active service in the Philippines. On the day after Pearl Harbor, the Philippines, too, were under attack. Defense here was pitifully hampered by lack of men and planes. With his knowledge of past campaigns, particularly those of his father in this very area, MacArthur withdrew his meager forces into the mountains of the Bataan Peninsula. From the rocky fortress of Corregidor, he directed an operation as crucial as any in the war. This early campaign in the Philippines, the heroic fighting by a lonely army of Filipinos and Americans for almost half a year, caused a critical delay in the Japanese timetable of attack. Back at home, the leader of the first desperate ground fighting became a symbol to a nation just beginning to gird itself for all-out war. The people found in him what they were beginning to discover in themselves, a spirit of intense determination. Suddenly, MacArthur was ordered by President Roosevelt, who regarded him as our greatest general, to leave to carry on the fight from Australia. Leaving the Philippines hurt him deeply. As always, he wished to be at the front, beside his comrades. When finally they were forced into the infamous march of death of Bataan, his promise to them was, I shall return. They believed him implicitly. Until his arrival in Australia, the plan had been to await the Japanese attack and prepare as well as possible. Then it became apparent that the new Southwest Pacific commander had another plan. He had meant exactly, I shall return. He was determined to carry the war to the enemy, to New Guinea, which was the direct route back to the Philippines. A long struggle lay ahead against huge numbers on countless islands. There seemed to be but one way, 
blast the enemy from every one of his island positions in the Pacific. Victories came, but they were costly. Was there some other way? Knowing the area, knowing the enemy, utilizing all our air and naval skill, the commander developed his plan to capture only a few key positions on the way to the Philippines. Now against these key positions, the pattern of attack. First, heavy preparatory fire to soften up the objective. unpredictable. In each case, the selection was dictated by strategy rather than by sympathetic terrain. There were many beaches. Some were ideal, hardly more than a matter of getting one's feet wet. Meanwhile, the gain was tremendous, the enemy never having expected us to come ashore here. There were other shores, many of them wicked. Sometimes the attack was in frail craft, sitting ducks for the enemy if surprise had not been accomplished. On another beach, amphibious tractors. Continually the envelopment, the flank attack, decisions, difficult ones, boldly made, based upon unique knowledge and experience. In addition, a mastery by MacArthur of combined operations of the three arms, the key to modern warfare. Leaders and men shared the glow of victory. Losses on the Allied side were relatively small since damaging frontal assaults were avoided. But thousands of Japanese prepared to fight to the death were rarely given this opportunity. Although many were captured, thousands more were isolated, their supply and communication lines destroyed. In the words of the strategist who conceived and carried out the plan, the main body of the enemy was left to wither on the vine. 